Deborah? Hi, it's Deborah Campbell here. Um, I would like to welcome everyone to our first Allied Health Professional webinar for 2015. I want to take a moment to thank Marie, Andre, and Lauren for organizing this webinar, and also to welcome Lynn Charbonneau, who will be joining uh, Marie, Andre, as our Allied Health Professional representative uh, on the C Educational Committee for the Canadian Heart Rhythm Society. Our webinar uh, this evening is titled Cardiovascular Implantable Electronic Device Infections from Treatment to Prevention. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Suzette Turner, who is our presenter this evening. I guess it's afternoon, depending on which time zone you're in. Suzette is the nurse practitioner for the Arrhythmia Service at Sunnybrook in Toronto. For those who do not know Suzette, she is a very dedicated um, and a well-respected professional who always has her patients at the center of the care she provides. She has completed a lot of work on improving device infections at Sunnybrook, and she has been more than willing to share her experience and expertise. Suzette, on behalf of the Allied Health Group, we want to thank you for presenting this evening. Thank you very much, Deborah. Thank you all for joining us. And as Deborah mentioned, I'd like to speak to you about cardiovascular or cardiac implantable electronic device infection from treatment to prevention. So I have nothing to disclose, and I would uh, like to just mention briefly here that a, few, a couple, of, well, three years now in January and February issue, uh, Aging Well, a journal put on by the uh, AMDA conference, uh, had on its cover page, Infection After Implant, Cardiac Devices Warrant Vigilance. So it's gone mainstream. I'd just like to talk to you about the learning objectives for today, and I would like to spend some time reviewing the clinical manifestations of uh, cardiac implantable electronic device infections, review the risk factors, discuss the pathogenesis, determine diagnosis, discuss preventative and treatment strategies, as well as review current and emerging therapies in the prevention of uh, cardiac implantable electronic device infections. So I'm showing a slide here that's probably uh, well known in the community about the increase in the infection burden for pacemaker and ICDs. And this was published in 2011 in Jack by Greenspun and others. And you see here uh, over 504% increase in defibrillator infections, as well as overall 96% increase. So uh, we have something here to work on in terms of what we're doing for and to our patients. So the types of infections uh, that we see in our patients are mostly primary infections. That is, the device pocket is the source of the infection. And secondary infection, as you know, bacteremia from a, a different source, for example, hemodialysis vascular access or dental abscess, and again, increase in, in the infection rate from, for example, the same study from 93 to 2008, from 1.53 to 2.41%. So the risk factors for uh, cardiac implantable electronic device infections, of course, we know advanced patient age, comorbid conditions such as diabetes and renal failure, immunosuppression, anticoagulation, fever within 24 hours of implantation, presence of catheters such as hemodialysis catheter, postoperative hematoma, or long-term corticosteroid therapy. In terms of procedure characteristics, we know that lack of antibiotic prophylaxis will increase the risk of infection for our patients. Recent device manipulation, for example, generator change or lead revision, presence of abandoned leads, number of implanted leads, so the more leads you implant, the more the risk of infection increases. The amount of indwelling hardware, there are some people who have remote to the device uh, pocket or the leads, for example, your knees or you know clips in your brain, so the more hardware you have. Temporary pacing before permanent device placement. Device replacement or revision. Smokers, 
physician experience all um, have are risk factors for infection. So I'd like to start by asking you a question. What is the procedure considered to have the highest risk of infection for uh, cardiac implantable electronic device patients? Is it the first implant, upgrading, replacement, or revision? So we've just gone over that. And if you chose revision, you would be correct. This study done in uh, this uh, uh, case series done and evaluated in Europe, uh, published in Europace in 2012, shows clearly here that there is an increased risk of infection for replacement. A close second is revision and, of course, re upgrading or first implant. So then which of the following are risk factors for device infection? Is it generator change, physician experience, presence of temporary pacing wire, long-term corticosteroids, or congestive heart failure? If you responded all of the above, you would be correct. And again, another study from Europe, a lot of studies out of Europe regarding infection, shows that there's an odds ratio of 15.04 for early re-intervention, as well as corticosteroid use, corticosteroid use 13.9 and renal failure 11.9. Of course, all of these are, are odds, uh, you know, increases your odds of developing an infection, but it's, it's of note that uh, early reintervention, corticosteroid use, and renal failure increases your risk. So why is this happening to our patients? And I'd like to spend a few moments here talking about biofilm. You probably heard a lot about this, but uh, this is certainly the, one of the more important phenomena and we haven't heard a lot about it in the la prior to the last 10 years, but now it's everywhere. And where do you have biofilm? Something like your dental caries is a biofilm, or that slime that we see on ship hulls, for example. And what happens is you have your planktonic, as in stage one, uh, planktonic single cell bacteria coming together, forming communities, coalescing, feeding off even the dead material, forming this slimy zone protective barrier, reproducing, and in the process, changing even their DNA. So what you have are very difficult, slow-growing, uh, multicellular uh, bacteria that is very hard to treat. It is even said that for antibiotics to be anywhere close to be effective, we would have to be giving 500 to 5,000 times the dose that we're giving now. So this whole process of biofilm formation, which is what puts our patients at risk, is a very, very uh, detrimental thing. And so we need to be vigilant in the, the way we assess our patients and or evaluate the, their risk for infection. How does it happen? Here, for example, Sohail in his poster in 2013 shows the bacteria being released into the bloodstream. And of course, that slimy extra uh, curricular matrix breaking off, forming clumps, and of course going to other parts of the body, of course exposing you to risk of bacteremia and um, even more complications. So in terms of the evolution, here we have uh, thinning of the skin on the left. You see that there is like a dimple and eventually exposure of the device, very detrimental to our patients. So what is the co most common organism? Is it MSSA, MRSA, Coag negative staph, Escherichia coli, or Streptococcus? If you guessed Coag negative Staphylococcus, you would be correct. And in fact, Staphylococcus, uh, approximately 70% of all infections are related, whether it's Coag negative, methicillin sensitive, or methicillin resistant. And of course, there are others like your gram-positive, gram-negative, your polymicrobial, your fungal, and your, your uh, culture-negative, those pockets. How is the diagnosis made? 70% of the time, you will see it in the patient's pocket. So in the pocket, you will see some purulence or inflammatory changes, tenderness to persistent pain, or loss or thinning of the subcutaneous tissue as previously demonstrated. You'll also have, uh, in terms of deeper infection, a little bit more subtle at times, but it can involve the transvenous portion of the lead, where you have valve endocarditis, right or left-sided, fever of undefined origin, or vague symptoms of 
malaise, fatigue, and anorexia. So again, Sohail uh, in 2007 and older slide, but still very relevant, showing that 70%, whether it's 52% of the pocket alone or pocket with bacteremia is in the 17%. Uh, so we need to be vigilant with our device pockets. Uh, in 2010, the American Heart Association uh, created a scientific statement regarding the management of device infections, and this was from Badur and his team. And some of the highlights of it is that in terms of diagnosis, all patients should have two sets of blood cultures. The pocket also should be cultured if there's an opportunity for that. And um, patients with positive blood cultures who uh, should have TEE. This is not always feasible, fiscal restraints or just um, availability of t machines and, and um, physicians to do it. Uh, but it is the most sensitive test. And all adults suspected of having infections should undergo TEE to evaluate the left-sided heart uh, valves. There's a class two benefit uh, that all patients should at least be seen by an ID doctor. This is what we do at our facility here. Uh, and in, class, in terms of class three benefit, never should the pocket be aspirated. You'll find from time to time people wanting to do that or people new to the ID service will come ordering things like this. It, it should never be done. So is this an infection based on what we've discussed before? By all intents and purpose, you can see here fat necrosis, so the dimpling of the skin. So yes, this is an infection. Or is this an infection? You can see the pus along the suture line here. So obviously an infection. This is the more, um, this is the one that is more most diagnostic. But we should be, we should be open to all aspects of infection. Patient coming into the clinic who was a healthcare provider with his device exposed like this, having had it for two weeks, it begun with a pimple. So I'll just briefly touch on a case here, and it began with a 74-year-old. I'll call her TS with chronic kidney disease history, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. QRS of 160 milliseconds, New York Heart Association of three, with progressive symptoms of heart failure. Uh, she was upgraded to our CRT device and came to the clinic 30 days post uh, upgrade with a pocket looking like this. Here clearly it's erythemous, it was very painful. There was a small drainage there. You can see the tape marks um, causing some abrasion there. But in a week, it opened, drained all the pus, and it appeared like this. So what do we do with such a patient? patient? Should this patient be admitted to hospital, or can she be managed as an outpatient? Should she be started empirically on antibiotics? And if so, which one? When should infectious disease specialists be consulted? Should the device be removed? And which components? How long should antibiotics be given? And so what would you suggest for this patient? Would you close the wound and antibiotic if evidence of active infection? Or would you do antibiotics as in number two plus explantation of device and leads? Or antibiotic and explantation of device? If you chose number two, you would be correct based on what we discussed. And as you can see here, the picture on the right, it, it eventually opened up and the device was expo exposed. And this all happened in a very short time period. So Sohail, again, and his group, Dabene, they have an algorithm or a, a guideline, so to speak, for how we should approach these patients. As mentioned before, all patients should have blood work. And in the blood work, we should have two sets of cultures. We should have C-reactive proteins, ESR, erythrosedimentation rate. And then, based on the guideline, we should determine whether or not uh, we should um, continue antibiotics. And here it tells you if, if the device removal is planned within 24 hours, um, it's saying no, but most facilities will not let such a patient go without starting antibiotics right away. Again, it is only a guideline. So how do you determine the duration of the therapy? Uh, again, it's based on the blood culture. So if you have negative blood cultures on the right, 
uh, and it's determined to be a pocket infection, 10 to 14 days of antibiotics, which is the most common one that we, we normally do. If it's just generator or lead erosion, 7 to 10 days. But for the most part, it's going to be a two-week course of antibiotic. If the TEE is negative, uh, treat with antibiotics, again, for two weeks, as mentioned, and it based on organism, of course. If there's valve vegetation, now we're talking about more complicated treatment courses of four to six weeks. So the disposition here is individualized. Admit when you have systemic symptoms. Dependent or with signs of device exposure. Uh, TEE, as mentioned, if cultures are positive, and this is more sensitive. Um, blood work, including inflammatory markers, ESR and C-reactive protein, blood cultures times two, swabs for bacterial culture if there is purulent drainage, ID to advise re-antibiotics and or removal. Uh, and of course, as uh, people in the taking care of patients pretty much know the routine after you've seen it for a while, but for completeness, uh, we need ID consult in terms of direction for antibiotics. Patients are getting more complex with more complex comorbidities, and sometimes what is the basic needs a little bit of um, um, monitoring, especially in patients who are MRSA for vancomycin and so on. So we need uh, pharmacy involvement as well. And the, the duration of the antibiotic depends on the, the uh, type of infection. So I can't finish without saying something here about the replace registry. And in that registry, the most significant point uh, was that infected patients were more likely to have postoperative hematoma. So that was 22 versus 0.98 percent. I don't know of many facilities that still use providine, but it also showed some in, uh, significance there that patients that, that developed infection also were still having providing uh, iodine use as well as lower implantation volume. So the takeaway from that, try to avoid hematomas. It increases the patient risk. And what we call hematoma is anything that's palpable, that's protruding greater than two centimeters. Uh, early reintervention in this case is associated with a 15 times increased risk. So how do we manage the pocket hematoma? We observe and closely follow up if it's small uh, or there's minimal to no tenderness. But if it's tense and the, the incision is threatening the suture line, painful, uh, reintervention is indicated. We, had, we try uh, not to do this. And so we do pressure dressings and try our best to manage without reintervening. Bernie and his group out of Ottawa there uh, determined that warfarin is better than bridging. Uh, and, and this was significant where the study was stopped early. So that was 3.5% versus 16%. Uh, there are still uh, implanters who refuse to do this. And so we have to work within the system we are, are working in. But um, it, it, it has been proven. And um, for all intents and purposes, it's the most common practice now, warfarin on um, surgery on warfarin. So another question for you, which is not recommended to prevent CIED infection? Is it routine parenteral antibiotic before procedure, needle aspiration of swollen wound for bacterial culture if suspected infected wound, avoid giving heparin post-op, or keeping the dressing intact post-op? If you guess needle aspiration, and it, it seems like a sore point, but uh, people still try to do this. So the most important thing in, in anything is prevention. And in, in for, uh, for our patient population, most desirable. So for before device implantation, we're going to defer if the patient has a fever. We look for signs of phlebitis. We try to remove all indwelling lines that are unnecessary, ensure the white count is low, ensure that their INRs, for example, the other day I was told of a patient who had an INR of six, um, but be vigilant in making sure that the patient is stable. Blood sugars are another big one. Sugar near the skin bacteria likes that. 
So we're going to optimize blood sugars before the patient goes in for surgery. Of course, antimicrobial prophylaxis and hair removal immediately before the procedure. Skin cleansing with chlorhexidine, again, proven better. Uh, it's fast-acting, and it has a residual effect, unlike povidine, not disabled by blood, and it must dry before starting skin incision. An old study by Alexander, and it's 1983, but you see again on the right where uh, Clipper AM of this procedure is much better than, say, the PM before. So uh, something to inform all our, our care providers. Prophylactic antibiotics, again, ANCEF, uh, 2 grams is standard, 60 minutes before procedure. Some patients are given an additional dose if the procedure is prolonged. And if penicillin allergy, clindamycin, I know some facilities use vancomycin, but we save that for our MRSA patients. And the recommendations I mentioned before, skin prepping, proper draping in the OR, uh, so your mask and your gloves and cap, uh, surgical attire, the OR team should be mindful. During procedure, all labs should have sterile infection control practices in place, aseptic techniques, uh, appropriate hand washing, universal precautions, and minimize tissue trauma. After implantation, application of pressure dressing, avoid heparin injection if possible, never perform needle aspiration, evacuation of hematoma only when significant tension. In terms of incision care, these are all basic, by the way, but you would be amazed at how many times they're ignored. So proper hand hygiene before and after dressing changes. Protect with sterile dressing. Now, there is no evidence, no, no research that has been done for this, but because of the potential for contamination of the site, we cover it with a sterile dressing. Uh, we educate the patient and family regarding proper incision care post-discharge surveillance for up to one year, and we describe all the characteristics to the patient and compare uh, c clinical evidence and guidelines as well in terms of patient care. Secondary prophylaxis, not recommended. Recommended only if the patient has incision and drainage at other sites, as in, for example, an abscess or patients with residual leak after device placement for attempted closure, as in ASD, PDA, or VSD. So to remember the four moments of hygiene at our facility, we have four moments. I'm made aware that there are some facilities with five moments. Wash your hands before entering the patient's room, before doing any procedure to the patient, after body fluid exposure, and after patient uh, environment contact. There are, of course, new and emerging technologies. The antibacterial envelope, which um, now is resorbable. Gene and cell transfer, which still has a way to go. The wearable cardioverter defibrillator. I noticed at HRS they spoke a lot about these, especially for patients with infections. Rechargeable generators. Uh, Leadless pacing system. And of course, the subcutaneous ICD uh, that avoids the, intra the tr uh, transvenous leads and the biological pacemaker. So I mentioned before about Tyrex, uh, and here it shows just the, the, the changes over the nine weeks that it takes to resorb the, the, the envelope. And uh, so we're waiting now on clinical trials. Uh, the RAPID study, that is a randomized study, because up to now this is for the, the Tyrex pouch. There were no randomized study, a very large worldwide study uh, to demonstrate the effectiveness of Tyrex absorbable. And another large study that we just finished with over 11,000 patient, patients is the PADIC trial. And we studied centers and not patients. The recruitment is completed, so we're just waiting for evaluation of data. We're waiting for that uh, because it, it explored a lot. It explored post-procedure antibiotics, intra-procedure in, uh, intra wash, uh, for the most part in our area here, there is not a lot of studies, as I mentioned. For example, the use of dermabond, there is no real evidence to show that that is of benefit to the patient. Uh, the use of uh, 
uh, decolonization prior to procedure. And just recently, I think it was in January, that a, uh, Kansas showed that there was no benefit to uh, removing the, the capsule, capsulectomy in the pocket. So it, uh, in fact, it, it, it showed some harm where it increased the risk of hematoma. We're waiting for the results of these trials so that we can have some general practice changes or reinforcement of what is already done. So to review, uh, the Staphylococcus species account for the majority of infections in cardiovascular implantable device in patients. Antibiotics need to be as close to the incision time as possible. Redosing is required for long procedures. Uh, decrease the OR traffic. And, uh, you know, if you were to ever watch a hip replacement or a knee replacement, it's like they're going on a space shuttle and everybody is dressed from head to toe and it's a proper OR environment. But for some reason, I think uh, we tend to get a little lax in, in device patient care. And so the OR sometimes can have increased traffic. We have to be remi mindful of that. Proper air exchange and, and temperature is also important. Clipping for hair removal. Continued warfarin is better than bridging. We still don't, we can't use the NOAX for patients who have valves and so on, so we still use warfarin for that population. Early follow-up and patient education from start to finish, we have to remind our patients. So you'd be surprised at how many patients still don't remember. They come back six weeks later with the steri strips on or dirty dressings or dried blood. So patient education, very important. And of course, complete removal of the device is required for cure. And we are awaiting the results of the padded trial. So that is my contribution. I thank you very much for your time. And uh, I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. I'm finished. Any questions? Hi, Suzette. It's Deborah. Hi, Deborah. I have a question, um, and we've just started doing this recently in our clinic. They're not deep infections, but do you have much experience with honey patches? No, I heard. I you know I heard someone from Michigan speak about that, and. Uh, I don't. I don't have any experience. I was surprised, actually, because I was thinking honey would, you know, increase the risk of bacteria mm -hmm. and device and exposure to that. But uh, no, I'm sorry, I don't have any um, mm. experience with that. Does anyone online have any experience with that? And what has has been your experience, Deborah? Um, well, same as yours, we've only had two cases. They were very superficial, but we had really good um, uh, outcomes with it. Um, oh, but yeah. I haven't been able to actually um, get any sort of data or clinical uh, trials. Um, oh. I haven't been able to come across any literature that supports it, although I know they've been using it for other things. So um, I'm... I'm just interested. Obviously, no one online has has been doing this or isn't saying that. Uh, yeah, no, I, stay tuned. I don't. <laughs> I did hear case about case I did hear about it being done in Michigan, and, okay. um, but I did look in the literature. I didn't find much. Thank you for your question. Any other questions? Hello. That's probably it. Is that no one? Uh, okay. okay. Well, thank you all very much for your attention, and thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to listen to this presentation. I look forward to having your feedback, and have a great day. Thank you.